The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guests and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of S4, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. Any rebroadcast or reproduction of this broadcast or podcast without express written consent of S4 is strictly prohibited. Listener discretion is advised. Because we don't understand how life formed, it is difficult to estimate this probability. The likelihood of a complex molecule like DNA being created by random collisions of atoms in a primordial ocean is fantastically small. In an infinite universe, it would happen in some places, but they would be very far apart. If we want to find advanced intelligent life, our best bet is to listen for radio signals. Look up to the stars and the forest that surround. Do you see them? Do you hear them? Are they there? SpacedOutRadio.com presents S4 with Forest Moon Paranormal's Eric Cooper and friends. Also, take the time to join the Forest Moon Paranormal Facebook group. I knew I should have made a left turn in Albuquerque. Space travelers, it's time to go live on S4 with Eric Cooper. And welcome to S4 with Eric Cooper, broadcasting live from the beautiful mountains of Concrete, Washington. Tonight we are talking about missing people. Where do they go and is it paranormal? Tonight on our panel we have Eric Markham, our FMP scientist, R. Keith Andrews, astrologer and alien specialist, Michael Hall of UFOI Team, myself Corey Reese, and your host for Spoon Paranormal Zone, Mr. Eric Cooper. Hey, good evening, everyone. And yeah, it's it's raining, and uh, I don't I don't know if Mother Earth knows it's supposed to be spring or not, but it's definitely not spring showers. <laughs> For our locals uh, listening, uh, tomorrow two o'clock at Annie's Pizza up here in Concrete, we have our own Michael Hall coming in to talk about paranormal and the law, the legal aspects of the paranormal. So, looking forward to that training. It's going to be awesome. And hopefully Michael's ready for it. <laughs> so tonight, I'm ready. We uh, outstanding. So tonight we are talking missing people. Now I want to differentiate. Uh, we're, we're not talking about the uh, you know the the random hiker, the random hunter that goes up 
uh, gets hurt, whatever, it gets lost, and search and rescue has to run out and find them. That's not what we're talking about. If you're familiar with Missing 401 and David Paul Ides and his immense research, we're talking about these folks that, and we're going to go over the patterns, but there, there's a lot, there's there are thousands of people missing globally. We're not just talking nationwide, you know, the United States, we're talking globally in national forests that a lot of them are high IQs. Um, a lot of them are doctors, scientists. Uh, it, they just come up missing. And, you, you know, you're walking down the trail in the mountains and uh, you're talking to your kid or your best friend. One minute, you turn around and they're gone. It's not like a cougar came out and grabbed them. It's not like a bear snatched them up. Um, and we're going to get into all this. But uh, how y'all doing tonight? Just great things. How's yourself? <laughs> Good. I'm studying environmental science right now, and I'm done with my associate's degree and start my bachelor's May seventh. So, uh, yeah, doing well, congratulations good. Congratulations on that. Uh, yeah, two years later, and I finally got my degree, um, and that'll help in a lot of different areas. Because, as, as you guys know, but some of our listeners don't know, is uh, I'm paranormal, but I also work on terrorism, on disaster response, on uh, a whole lot of different areas, from criminal, you know, from the serial killer side, uh, the common thief. These are areas I study, as well as getting the community prepared for disasters. So these are some of the areas I, I look at and work on. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm busy all the time. Um, now. Michael, I, I know you got to listen to David Paul Ides just a couple of weeks ago at, at the, the UFO con they had in Ocean Shores, or not Ocean Shores, I keep saying that, but uh, in Washington anyway. Yeah, yeah, that was the uh, Quinault Beach uh, UFO Paranormal Summit, um, yeah, down there at Ocean Shores at the um, uh, Quinault Beach Resort and Casino. And are there any new trends that he talked about? You know, um, he uh, he talked about some of these uh, kind of maps that he's been putting together of these missing right. uh, people and how they kind of correlate with certain areas of the country. This is talking about the United States now with uh, right. uh, basically uh, mountainous areas. You know, you're talking the Cascades and, um, uh, you know, the Rocky Mountains and then, of course, uh, on the East Coast, the Appalachians and those kinds of things. You don't see a whole mm-hmm. lot of uh, missing people in the Plain States, in the middle of the country for some reason. And he was correlating some of those uh, same sighting reports with um, with Bigfoot events as well. Confirmed Bigfoot sightings, in other words. So I, I have a feeling some of those could be uh, corresponding to each other, and some of them uh, might be just because they are in uh, federal lands and uh, state parks. So we'll talk about all of that tonight, I'm sure. So yeah, and, and yeah, you bring up you know the the certain areas, and, and what seems to be a common denominator is mountains that connect with water. Uh, and, and I know you've heard him talk about that before. Uh, whether uh, a lot of the the missing people were found in, which is what we're going to work on. We're going to look for uh, missing people reports. Is what I like to look for uh, on our end of it, <laughs> and see if they miss, uh, see if they fit the patterns. Um, so let's talk yeah. about some of these patterns. Now we're we're going to, you know, I have a lot of time with Bigfoot. Bigfoot is not an abductor. No. Uh, the, the the cases you hear about here uh, with Bigfoot sightings, he's very docile, he's very secretive, and, and he stays to himself. So I do have a hard time with accepting Bigfoot as being a part of the missing people. Uh, and we're going to talk to Keith about the alien side because I, I think there's a lot going on. It's not just pointed at one thing. I I think governments involved with some of it. I think aliens are involved with some of it. 
I think a possibility of wormholes or some kind of portal that making them disappear is responsible for some of it. Um, I don't think you can point to any one thing. Well, and I would definitely agree with you on that part. Well, technically, <clears throat> pretty much all of what you just said makes sense. Mm -hmm. but and actually, I'm going to go outside the box real quick and say fairies. And I say fairies because a lot of these missing people are found around berry bushes. Right. You know what? You know what the funny part is? Fairies fall under the category of the ancient races, which is right. sort of half of your aliens, if you will. They just happened to live here before we did. Right. And, you know, I'm not going to get too much into it because uh, it'll be brought up on the uh, FMP show, but we actually had our first Banshee encounter uh, <laughs> um, two nights ago. And, oh, well, nice. It, well, maybe if not. You're, oh, no, if you're, if you're familiar with the Banshee, there's not much we can do. The Banshee is a warning. Part of the fairy race, or part of the fey race, I should say. Yes. But at the same time, um, they can be there for, for depression, for, uh, you know, they, there, there's many reasons a Banshee can show up, not just over a death. Um, so, you know, there wasn't much we could do on the paranormal side of it. We couldn't remove a Banshee. Um, the Banshee is not there to harm. The Banshee is there to warn. But yeah. the other end, the other end of that case was the Enku that were there along with the Banshee. And again, if you're familiar with the Enku, they're kind of like little imps. They're, they're kind of like the, the fairy version of the Grim Reaper. Um, again, not there to harm, they're there to warn. So, well, it was a very interesting case, and we'll talk about that during the FMP team show here in a couple of weeks. Um, but I do think, you know, some of these missing people are possibly caused by the, the Fae realm as well. Just something that I'm not sure has been brought up on, you know, in Paul Lighty's research, but, uh, because a lot of people don't believe in the fairy existence, but they are here. <laughs> They've like, been here for a long time. <laughs> heck, they've been here longer than people have. <clears throat> exactly. Exactly. So cluster maps, again, uh, you, you know, a lot of the cluster maps were are found close to mountains and water. Um, you, you come into the search and rescue aspect, uh, tracking dogs. You, they, you know, they'll they'll put the scent of the missing person uh, to the tracking dog. Tracking dog looks confused and goes, well, "What, what, what the hell am I supposed to do with that?" Um, there's no scent, or they just refuse to search. That in itself, yeah. to me, is paranormal. You know, because these these dogs are trained. They're cadaver dogs. They're they're trained for searching yeah and if they don't have a scent where do they go um so personally i've been in search and rescue i was on the ground team for a couple of years back in the 80s i was in the four by four team for roughly a year until i got removed uh we won't go into that story uh people don't like being called out for uh not doing the right thing but i got removed and on the search and rescue side, um can honestly say we spend our own money, we take our own time for training. Um and these particular search and rescue teams on these cases have been scouring the area of the missing person for weeks, days, you know, days in some cases. And the missing person the, the body was found in the exact same area they had already searched. Yeah. So, you know, and, and no one's got anything to benefit. No one's getting any monetary gain or anything like that. These these are volunteers that that are trying to find the missing. That's what they do. They do a phenomenal job. So if the body was found in the same area, then I can guarantee you if it would have been there when they searched that area, they would have found it. Um. You know, Eric, the bodies. 
Go ahead. There, there is a correlation. Yeah, let me let me just uh, jump in here for a second. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, R. Keith can kind of uh, corroborate this. There is a cor- correlation with one of the famous, um, basically, human mutilation abduction cases about UFOs uh, with the guy named Todd Seas, who was um, uh, a hunter. He went out in his 4x4 to scout for deer during uh, the beginning of deer season and uh, never came back. Uh, this, the search and rescue teams were immediately called uh, that even same day and uh, searched everywhere around his house and on the path that he took off in. Um, his body was found very close to his house in an area that they actually had searched before. So the whole idea mm-hmm. that potentially uh, UFOs uh, or aliens are abducting people and then uh, bringing them back to the act- actual location or not too far from the location of abduction is uh, kind of a strange but uh, interesting uh, uh, thing here in this whole area. Right. Well, the the thing with that is when you're dealing with with abductions, especially if they're you know if they're shall we say non-aggressive, um, if the person is brought back alive, then that would make total sense for it being the uh, being an off-worlder. If it is, if the person is unfortunately brought back deceased, then you know you've got another problem because on the whole, off-worlders don't return dead bodies. They'll space them or they'll eat them. Take your pick. In right. some cases, they uh-huh. use them for fuel, but they don't just waste them. Good yeah, point. A conundrum. Excellent point, though. Um, and, and, you know, the ones that are never found, and I would probably say off-world, and that would, limit, that would you know, knock them out. Um, you know, and I don't have the statistics in front of me, but as far as uh, how many were found dead, how many were found alive, uh, that kind of thing. But I know the ones that were found alive had, you know, the the common abductee pattern of missing time. They don't remember how they got lost. They don't remember, uh, you know, what happened prior to. They just, you know, and, and in a lot of those cases, even the, the searchers that found them had no idea how they got to that point. Because, you know, when you're, when you're a search commander, the the one in charge of the search team, you have a certain um, a, a certain map. You, you go out to a certain point on the map where you you know that that person, based on their their health, uh, where they were planning on being, that kind of thing. We're only going to search for this point because they shouldn't be beyond that point. Just hiking, right? And a lot of these people were found beyond that point. Or on a mountain range that they shouldn't have even been near. In one case, there was a five-year-old that was found, uh, I, I believe, a mountain range away, still alive. How did he get up there? How did well, a five-year-old yeah. he, who who doesn't have any mountain climbing experience to get to the other side of the mountain range? Well, that's one where you can just about categorically go, "That's an <laughs> off-worlder picking him up," or. The other, which is just about as rare, wormhole, because there are um, planetary wormholes. There's reported cases of people vanishing out of the States and showing up minutes later in England. Right. Huh. I've heard it, of that. Yeah. Ex- ex- explain that to the, you know, the phone call. Uh, yeah, uh, Dad, I'm in Germany. I don't know how I got here, but can you give me a plane ticket back home? <laughs> that, yeah, that would be a hard one to explain. Oh, that one you don't even bother explaining. You just go, um, "Well, I opened the door to the you know, to the mall, and uh, here I am, Dad. This is not <laughs> the mall I opened the door to." <laughs> right. Uh, problem um, is, in, in most society, at that point, they tell you to stop drinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, or, or stop taking the mess. Yeah, we're going to get you in rehab now. <laughs> well, it's, I remember one case in particular that I ended up dealing with where the person 
where the person actually had a witness to their arrival, and we'll use the arrival a little loosely, but they literally right. just faded in in front of the person. <laughs> right? They literally stepped out of the wall, and of course, the person standing there going, uh, You want to explain? And then the victim says, uh, Yeah, I'd love to. Any ideas how? <laughs> you know? The problem is, you know, can you imagine stepping into a foreign country and not understanding what they're trying to tell you? <laughs> oh, Lord, yeah. John in the uh, uh, chat room says, uh, why are wormholes in mountainous areas? Well, wormholes are basically just a portal hole, and you can have a portal anywhere. Yeah, and, well, and, yeah. And then uh, maybe you can explain about stargates, because stargates are a little bit different than wormholes, but same concept, aren't they? Essentially, yes. Stargates are, are quite literally built, um, and they're built by mm -hmm. the, you know, they're, <laughs> they're built by specific people. Wormholes are a natural effect. Now, that, that brings up the point, um, would... Because a lot of these cases, uh, oftentimes a storm uh, hits immediately after the person disappears. And now, now the, the storm, one, stops search and rescue or helicopters from coming in to look for the person. And it, it's just awkward that a storm hits. Now, would that be indicative of a wormhole, possibly? Yeah. Especially if it's a if it's a, a floating one, because what you're dealing with is the electromagnetic pulse of a storm interacting in just the perfect way with the biomagnetic signature of the human. Okay. okay. So it's something it. that trying to calibrate is going to be a royal pain. Now, yeah. and, and here's another here, here's another uh, oddity, but a lot of these people, uh, they come up missing between the hours of 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. Does that mean anything to anybody? Well, when you're dealing with oh. that, that is your most, that is your highest um, level in, you know, in any local area where people are, where the majority of people are sleeping, drawing that pulse level that much higher because people when they're awake okay. they're they're concentrating on day to day when they're asleep their mind can go you know the energy can go wherever it wants okay yeah. and don's got don's got a question are floating wormholes like portals on earth yes okay. how's that for short <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, you know, okay, there is, uh, there's another issue here that's very similar to that that uh, the Canadian ufologist Grant Cameron has been bringing up now. These uh, these Zendras, they are calling them, um, seem to be portals. Uh, and one of the major ones that uh, Grant Cameron has been reporting on is at uh, Mount Basta in California. Matter of fact, uh, I right. believe... We might have talked about this uh, at our last meeting when we got together. Was the um, in August? There is a uh, kind of a gathering down there at uh, Mount Shasta for a supposedly planned event in a Zendra, where you can uh, walk through the um, the portal and uh, and experience the other side of whatever reality is that is there. So. Uh, these 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 portals seem to um, also uh, kind of be in permanent areas as well. Well, yeah, but you got to remember with Mount with Mount Shasta, and there are a few that have that kind of of levels of necessary of the necessary energy. Um, they've had a lot of time. This is where intention becomes the real critical factor. And not uh, necessarily human intention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, because especially when you're looking at places like Mount Shasta, the, you know, your your earth spirits are, and 
rest assured, our spirits are far more real than most people realize. Um, they've put an awful lot of energy and a lot of focus because it's a beautiful place for meeting from their standpoint because of the fact that it was initially until it, until Mount Shasta became, if you will, a tourist spot. The the nature spirits used to be up there all the time in you know in full regalia. Wow. I, yeah, I, I'm I'm with Sandra on this. I, I'm sorry. I'm not going to go there to walk into a portal. Um, <laughs> it, it, it reminds me of Independence Day where all the stupid people are on top of the building going, welcome, aliens. Uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm going to go the other direction. Um, you know, I'm uh, curious, uh, but I can build my own. <laughs> you know? Right, right. Where, where the, the job of FMP is to close down portals, not to go walking into them. <laughs> Although you got to admit, it's a rush when you get over there. But you know that that unfortunately comes from somebody that's, shall we say, I've got a curiosity streak in that department that isn't necessarily healthy. But you got to remember that cur- you know curiosity killed the cat. Um, yeah, I, I'm I, not going to die. <laughs> no, but I've already done that one. Uh. <laughs> right. This is true. Um, I'll go to a UFO con. I'll go to a Paracon. Uh, but if it entails me walking into a portal, I'm not going to do it. Not out of fear, but just out of, uh, well, intelligence. Self-preservation. There we go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, um, yeah. And, and, you know, I, I definitely know that there are good aliens and I definitely know there are bad aliens. Um, you, you know, we work with both sides or work against some sides, but that's what we do. I'm not going to go looking for them because they find us anyway. <laughs> well, it, it oh. always fascinates me that people do that sort of thing along the same lines as it fascinates me when people go, well, I'm going up to a ski area or a hiking area and it says, don't go there. And I swear people take a look at those signs and don't see the don't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and again, I'll resort back to the uh, Darwin theory or the Darwin Awards. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> That's where the lack of intelligence comes in. Um, let's see. So I, I'm going to talk about a couple of the very bizarre, uh, I, I know, cases that Paul Reides. Now, I, I'm going to put this out there. Uh, if you look for Paul Reides' books, do not get them on Amazon. Do not get them on eBay. Go straight to Can-Am America or, or canammissing.com, I believe it is, and get the book straight from Paul Reides because he sells his books for $27. You look for the same books on Amazon or eBay, you're going to pay anywhere from 70 bucks to 150 Why? I don't know. Um, I went straight to the website and got them for 27 So if you well, want to get his books... The reason they charge more is they want money. Yeah. Well, that's why him. I'm putting it out to... That's why I'm putting it out to our listeners. If you want to get Missing 411 books or the cluster maps, go straight to Polite's website and get them there. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, I don't pay 70 bucks for any book. Well, I do for textbooks, but I, that's out of uh, my <laughs> GI Bill. I, do, I don't, I don't pay for the. It, it, my textbooks cost 250 bucks on up. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I know you've heard some of these uh, signs uh, as, as well. Uh, I know there were cases where someone took a pistol with them. Um, the person was missing. They found the pistol completely disassembled in, in a neat pattern. <laughs> Other cases where their clothes were found. They weren't found, but their clothes were found folded up and neatly stacked. Do you remember hearing those stories, uh, Michael? Yeah, those are fascinating stories. As a matter of fact, I've even heard the stories where uh, if the body was actually found of the missing person, uh, their their pants would be down. Uh, they yeah. would unbuckle their own belts for some reason. And, you know, there is a theory of uh, 
that when when people get dehydrated and uh, they're uh, you know out out in the elements, they they sometimes will get hot and they'll try to undress themselves even though they're suffering from hypothermia. Uh, so those are some of the mm-hmm. explanations that people have brought. But it's just <clears throat> strange that, that uh, uh, like you said, some of the clothing is uh, folded up and neatly placed next to, to the person or uh, they just find the clothes uh, alone and they don't find the person until potentially later when they realize the <laughs> that even the even the shoes have been missing and they don't and, and for some reason there is no um evidence that they had walked a long ways without their shoes there's no cuts on the feet and those kinds of issues so it also goes to the point where somehow they've they've been moved you know without uh, having to walk there themselves and, and and that's a good point because you know that discredits that hypothermia. I've had hypothermia, and my first thought was not to take my clothes off. My first yeah. thought was to look for my first thought was to look for more clothes or a big ass blanket so I didn't get colder. Um, <laughs> See, in, so, in my case, you know, in my case, it just didn't. The brain just quit. You know, you didn't, yeah. you walked around in a daze, you didn't try getting undressed. No, no. I remember, <laughs> I remember a situation where my, my fingers would just not even work. There was no way I could unbuckle my belt or unzip my pants because my fingers didn't work. I was so cold. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so uh, shifting over, um, I want to talk about the legalities of all this. Because, you know, when Pilates, when Pilates first got into research and all this, he had to fight the Forest Service to, re, you know, and he still fights them for release of these missing people cases. And, you know, it, they tried to tell him at one point it was to protect the families. Uh, well, that was kind of proven wrong. Uh, why would not, unless something weird is going on, they not want to get more exposure on missing people? Well, it cuts yeah. down tourism. Follow the well, money. There you go. You got and, a place where people are coming up missing that <clears throat> they charge. Either the local economy gets a boost because everybody drives through this town to go to Yellowstone, or there's some kind of fee charged. If it gets out that if you go here, there's a nice percentage chance that you might disappear without a trace. You know, we get first off, it's going to get sensationalized in the news, and of course, mm-hmm. you know, CNN is going to have it. You know, the Yellowstone serial killer or some catchy thing, and you know, it's just going to get sensationalized. Whether you know, I think uh, in a lot of cases, these four one ones. I mean, we're going the supernatural route. I think a lot of these are just, you know, people being stupid. I mean, look at the guy who got himself caught in a crevice and had to cut his own arm off. Right. There's other people out there that this is happening to that don't have <laughs> the intestinal fortitude to cut their arm off and crawl out of there. There are yeah, people that I get caught in places like, you know, I have found myself where I go rock climbing. And then I may, you know, and it doesn't seem that steep and then i take a rest and look and holy crap you know i'm on a nearly very it looks like i'm on a nearly vertical climb it didn't start out that way it didn't feel that way but now i'm Mm -hmm. in this tricky situation where it's either go up or you know (laughs) and so i've been lucky there's people who go out there and they're not lucky and as far as never being found again hey Nature does Nothing. not waste protein. No. <laughs> Meat gets and, well, and, and, and And that's the thing. A lot of these bodies that were found, uh, you know, they, they did the autopsy and whatnot. There was no, there, there was no, the predators wouldn't touch them. There, there was, you know, there was no uh, cougar marks. 
no bite marks, bears, wolves, coyotes. Your normal predatorial animals had not touched these bodies. Yeah. Uh, I know there, I know there was one case where, you know, the, the child, there was a child that had been missing for four years and they found his shoes. His shoes looked like they had just been taken out of the box from Walmart, for example. How yeah. does that happen? Well, that's a trophy that keeper. It, that doesn't happen. Well, yeah, yeah it Either, could. I mean, look at a trophy easy, keeper. But, Somebody kidnapped that child and or did whatever. They had possession of that child. Those shoes were the trophy. And maybe whatever remorse. So this probably not if it's a psychopath, but these people like to taunt authorities. They like to re- revisit the scene. They came back to where they had kidnapped that child and left the shoes sitting there. But and that even that why? does apply where human where adults are concerned as well. <laughs> I, I could well, get some of the people you see, some of the people you see that have like stripped off their clothes. I mean, look at the Franklin expedition; they got lead poisoning mm-hmm. and exposure. And as they're leaving their ship that's icebound, they're taking crap that they didn't need, like wardrobes and you know ship's furniture that had absolutely no bearing on their being able to survive. And, you know, when people get delirious, they do weird stuff. So, yeah, they take their pants off and walk around with their britches dragging around their ankles or something. It's When people are in, ex, you know, their survival in extrema, they're but, not you know, in Don, the right mind that we are in. Don is also bringing up, because I don't have, you know, there, there's thousands of cases. I don't have the, the the information of all those cases in front of me. But, yeah, that child's shoes were found two mountain ranges away. Um, and I, I can get on board with that to an extent, because, you know, pedophiles and serial killers and all that have been looked at. And, sure, that might be the case in some of them, but think about it. You're on top of a mountain range. You're a pedophile. Are you really going to take a, a body up a mountain range? They, they usually ain't that. <laughs> well, no. do we know that they're not living up there? <clears throat> I mean, you get you some. Mean, the, you're talking the criminal living up there. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. the person they abducted the child or took the child. I mean, I'm not saying there can't be portals or can't be, you know, y'all know I'm not a total disbeliever, but I'm mm-hmm. thinking a lot of this stuff is getting attributed to supernatural, uh, uh, you know, cause, and there's a perfectly mundane, unsupernatural answer that can fit just well, as easily, yeah. but doesn't sell books that- as well. And that's and, your scientific mind. And that's why we love you, Marco, because you use well, your scientific mind to play devil's advocate. <laughs> yeah, here's the funny thing there. This, this is one where I'm actually going to agree wholeheartedly with, with Marco. Because mm-hmm. there's an old saying that goes, when you, really, when you eliminate all possible, you know, all probable causes, when you remove all logical explanations... Whatever is left, however illogical, is the answer. And the funny right. part about it is, you have to really, you have to eliminate all of those possibilities first. You know, before exactly. looking for something twisted. And we also don't know what kind. We also don't know what kind. Let's take the shoes. Let me right. take this a little bit further on the shoes. The guy abducted. Okay, scenario, guy abducts the child, blah, 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 the shoes are gone. Years later, memory plays a trick on him. It looks like the same mountain. Is that the same mountain? Ah, what the hell, I'm parked. I'm going to leave the shoes here on this mountain. Well, it just happens to Mm -hmm. be that it's not the same mountain. I mean, a lot of times you can revisit an area and 
and think, yeah, this is the place, and then you find out, well, no, this, wait a minute, <laughs> you know. So that's still within the realm of the mundane human psychopath for the the shoes to be two ranges over. Yeah, when you're dealing with year with time, the the one that becomes complicated is when it's literally days or much more importantly hours later they're found that far away. Now that's then you've the thing. got if you got a kid situation. disappear in point A being found two mountain sides away at point B in a length of time that there's no way yeah, now, you know, no, the, the, the psychopath, unless he's got a jetpack or a, a helicopter, you know, there's <laughs> yeah. no way without technological advanced. assistance that child is going to go over from, you know, because we're talking, what, hundreds of miles on mountain ranges. You know, yeah. it might be yeah, if right. the crow flies, it's only a few miles, but up a peak, down a peak, if you take all the intervening topography between those two points, it can be hundreds of miles. Well, yeah, that like kid Don didn't is, get there in a couple hours, no. No, Dawn is just saying here that, that she believes that it was a week or so later, which is plenty of time for the mundane side to kick in. Yeah, you know, and, and, and Dawn, just to clarify, Don might be right, but I, I just listened to the interview, uh, one of Paul Eide's many interviews, and uh, that's why I bring this case up, because I swear he said four years. Uh, if the book said two weeks, I don't know. I'd have to go back and listen to it again. Well, but, a week or so or four years is still easily in the mundane level. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Here's a here's a thing that David uh, mentioned at the Quinault Beach uh, uh, summit. He, he he actually got in touch with uh, Les Stroud, the Survivor Man, uh, and uh, Les got an interest in uh, what uh, David was doing on his work. And uh, he uh, uh, David brought this case to uh, Les Stroud and says that there was this this child that uh, actually was found. Uh, quite a ways away uh, in a short enough period of time that he was wondering if if uh, it could be done. So he contacted uh, Les Stroud, and Les Stroud actually attempted the same uh, traverse over the mountain top and uh, down in a valley or whatever it was that the, the body was found. He said that he couldn't even come close to making that trek in the period of time that uh, was given uh, that this uh, uh, child had actually... Uh, made the trip so th those things are just kind of a conundrum for, for me is that uh, how could uh, young kids uh, I mean I'm talking I, I believe four-year-olds you know and even younger uh, are making these trips for some reason and and uh, the bodies are found and they can't figure out how they even got there mm -hmm. well there's something and, else no, you know, there, there's something else to take into consideration, especially if you're dealing with, with young kids that suffer from it. Somebody going through a wormhole, first and foremost, yes, it's a little disorienting, but what most people don't realize is the electromagnetic pulse can offset the heart. And in a young child, you couple that with the fear of being someplace, and it can stop it cold. So I mean, you can, especially with some of the with some of the um, the cross <laughs> cross spaces, if you will, that you end up going through, it can create enough to quite literally scare people to death. Mm -hmm. I'll bet. And, and, and it was brought up in the chat room as well. Uh, you, you know, a lot of the the. Kids that were found alive, uh, one of them did recall uh, seeing a hairy monster. Um, uh, another child talked about seeing kitties and doggies. Um, uh, you, you know, they all have different perceptions of what they saw and experienced. Yeah. Um, hairy monster, yeah, that that would... That could be a bear. That, coming from a kid, a child's perspective, it could be a bear, it could be a Bigfoot. 
Um, but again, I, I stand firm, unless you're from the South and are dealing with swamp ape, generally speaking, Bigfoot is docile. Uh, oh, I don't yeah. know of too many, I don't know too many cases where Bigfoot's ever attacked. Warned, yes, because there was a case here locally where uh, the guy was taking pictures and Bigfoot warned him. He threw a rock at him. It didn't hit him. It landed, oh, 10 feet away. He said, yeah, whatever. And he ignored it. And Bigfoot threw another rock and it landed, oh, about 20 feet away. And he said, yeah, that's not close enough until the rock landed at his feet. And he said, okay, I'm gone. Bye. But <laughs> generally speaking, unless they know your they they know your intentions. If you come up there, and I'm sure the photographer had no bad intentions, but for some reason that day he was invading a territory. They're territorial. So if they're in a bad mood, I guess, and they don't want you in their territory that day, then they can get a little honorary. But taking people, yeah. no. Yeah, the Bigfoot. I mean, I ran into Bigfoot myself, and it was a young one that ran into me and and helped. And they really are. They won't attack. They with a little kid, they will lead them back to wherever they belong once they figure out where right. they belong. But <laughs> killing people, not a not a prayer in my opinion. Not from anything I've run into. No, and, and speaking of that, uh, I, I did talk to Mr. Anderson, our uh, Bigfoot, local Bigfoot guy that's on the team, and we will set up a schedule of him. He's going to be on the show talking all things Bigfoot soon. We just got squeeze, to uh, squeeze him in. Um, but he's been in the Bigfoot, he's been in the Bigfoot field for uh, about 30 years here in Skagit County, Whatcom and Snohomish County. Um, so... Definitely going to be a great show because he's got a lot of stuff to put out uh, as far as his experiences go. But I, yeah, uh, I, I firmly believe if you were to pick these cases apart, some of them, I'm sure, like you said, Mark, are mundane. Some of them are going to be criminals, uh, you know, abductee, abductees, and that kind of thing. It's just there's too many of them to be one thing. <clears throat> The well, other yeah, interesting, yeah. <laughs> the other interesting thing that came up was uh, a cryptid that no one's found yet, and, and I'm 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 sure you heard of this theory too, uh, Michael, at his lecture where he's talking about pterodactyls or an ancient dinosaur race of flies, because it would explain how you get from point A to uh, an unrealistic point B on the other side of a mountain range. Right, and uh, also the, the Thunderbird uh, legends as well from the First Nations. Yeah, yeah. So it'd be interesting to get a, a cryptid specialist on the show talking about that side of it. Well, uh, we if can we could see. find one. That... Go well, ahead. The, the neat thing with the with the pterodactyls, the pteranodons, that sort of thing. Um, with the bigger ones, you'd be hard-pressed to find it to, to do it simply because the size of the nesting area. Now, that said, if you take a look at the pterodactyl itself, it wasn't that big, but it was strong enough to pull it off with a little kid. And there are, mm -hmm. you know, literally dozens of reports of you know, of the dinosaurs or suspected dinosaur that people haven't seen. You know, they haven't seen for, for years. Take a look at the obvious, and granted it's not a bird, is the Quelicanth off of Madagascar. Yeah. You know, they, yeah. they hadn't seen him for, you know, well, they hadn't seen them until 69. Right. One was right. It, the locals had been catching them for decades. They never they knew they weren't extinct. It was a naturalist who was actually and part of the thing that happened is the naturalist got a hold of the specimen. He was in I think he was in South America or something. He was uh, way away from where it was, but he wanted credit for the discovery. So they kept looking for him where he was and of course they weren't there. It wasn't until later a specimen showed up on off the coast of Madagascar. They're very deep. Oh yeah. Uh, you got to go if if 
you're at the limits of what a diver can do. The bottom time when you're going to coelacanth country is, I think, maybe 15, 20 minutes tops, and then you've got one hell of a decompression cycle going up. But, you know, these living fossils happen. But here's a, here's something I'm thinking that maybe throws the the woo-woo factor together with some science. You've got these mm-hmm. mountain ranges. They are huge, huge storage batteries. There's minerals. There's There's currents. There's probably portals opening up. What if these people that disappear just happen to be at the wrong place at the wrong time, a portal opens up and something prehistoric or the past? Because I know some physicists say all of time is happening now. Well, Where you're sitting uh, right now, yep. there's probably a T-Rex trying to eat a triceratops. You know, there... There's all of this is going on right now. What if you've got these mountains where all this ungodly amount of energy and mineral uh, sequestration is happening at the same time you've got like a time shift and one of these poor people just happens to walk in, they're face to face with a prehistoric predator they're eaten, the portal snaps shut, or everything goes back to what we consider normal. And there's no trace of them because they've been eaten in our distant past. And that's very odd of actually catching them in a fossilized point. You know, they're they're coming out the other end as a copper lip. You know, they're not <laughs> <laughs> well, the the only the only issue there around the time side the the issue of um, things happening because of the energy pattern absolutely the issue of something from the past stepping forward grabbing him uh, grabbing the person that could happen where it runs into a snag is they couldn't get back through it because you no, cannot okay. go back through time. Okay, maybe it's a matter of forward or, you know, they just, they take a step. And from one moment there in 2018, 27, whenever they disappeared, they take a step and all of a sudden they're in a fern forest surrounded by Utah T-Rex. raptors. Yeah, <laughs> you know, they just <clears throat> passed in that the membrane or they just... They just put the, they've just, whatever they've done, they've stepped into a time stream or a dimension or some parallel dimension they don't and, belong in. And, that and maybe some of these sense. people just, dis, maybe some of these people just disappear because, you know, the timeline has to uh, correct itself. Well, yes and no. I mean, it, I the thing I agree with mo- you know, wholeheartedly is stepping into a time warp and ending up, you know, a hundred years or however far into the future. They just cease to exist here and they're gone. You'll never see them again because they never died. They ended up way ahead of you is very probable, especially when you take into consideration the energy patterns that you're referring to as far as the crystalline linings go. Mm-hmm. So you know, that is... Go ahead. I wanted to take a second and kind of elaborate on the, uh, the reason why travel in time in reverse is, is uh, a bit tough. Um, so the theory basically goes that uh, all of us and everything around us, <coughs> excuse me, at the atomic level, is made up of stuff that was before. So, let's say 200,000 years ago, there was a rock. Well, atoms from that particular rock may be a part of one of your teeth right now. Okay? So, for you to be able to travel back in time, you would have to, at the atomic level, create everything that was 
at that time frame. So to do so, you would literally have to rip apart at the atomic level everything that is in the current time frame to reassemble everything in the past time frame. Hence, basically destroying the complete time-space continuum. Yeah, and that would pretty much sum it up. This is why you can move forward, but you can't go back. Hmm. Interesting. It's, okay, it's either it, way. Works, it, uh, it works forward, but it doesn't work back. I mean, if you move forward, you're taking... The, it seems like it's the same rule. You can't go backwards because you're made from stuff from the past. You shouldn't be able to go forward because you're taking preformed stuff from the past into the future. I don't know. Maybe the logic well, probably doesn't hold. It just something about it doesn't seem. Well, the where the where it does uh, the logic makes sense. It's just incomplete because when you take the the matter that is formed here, when you move it forward. You're taking that chunk of matter with you. Okay, whatever made you is currently in existence. So moving that complete object into the future isn't causing a problem because it's just bringing more matter forward. It's not pulling anything apart uh, from the present. Gotcha, gotcha. Whereas going backwards in our own timeline, going backwards would create... I can see where that would create the problem. Now, you could travel back in time in a parallel because your matter that you're taking back isn't part of that timeline. Yeah. And, you know, what's the point? I mean, that's sort of like... <laughs> well, that's where the where the problem with the parallel becomes the transitory issue. Because the vibratory rate in the parallel universe won't permit the vi won't mesh with the vibratory rate here. So you could look into the past in a parallel because you're not affecting anything. But again, because the vibratory rate is off, it's kind of like trying to mix oil and water. Okay, well, it's almost like more. somebody realized if you could travel back in time, you could screw a lot of crap up. And nobody would have a reality and nobody would have a history because somebody would always be going back in time trying to, you know, do the Biff maneuver where they get the, you know, they get the all, the sports almanac. There would always be somebody trying to improve their lot or their family's lot in life by going back and, and screwing with things and changing it. So it's almost like the creator's like, ah, nah. We ain't going to have that. You just can't go back in time other than as an observer. And no interaction. That is ultimately correct. You know, I've, I've had some interesting conversations with some very interesting people, but, you know, they, the neat part about it is that so much has to be left to speculation, but I still agree that you have to eliminate all of the logical possibilities first because most of them can be actually explained given enough time to piece it together. And forensics. Yes. Yeah, but yeah, but there's still, there's some of the cases I'll have to, I'm not a big fan of Polites, but... I will say that there are some cases that if he has put all the facts together, truthfully, without bias, there is no, you know, there is no non-esoteric, non-just paranormal or unknown answer. There's no solution that doesn't a, have to have but that, something paranormal. But that is. But that is the thing with Polites. He will never go out and tell what his personal opinion is. He has nothing to gain other than bring out the facts. Uh, and that is one thing he will say. You know, I've actually had discussions with Polites on, in chat, and we've actually <laughs> argued. 
uh, over, you know, it couldn't be this or it, it could be that. And he is very firm about not putting his own bias into it. Um, on that, we are at the top of the hour. It is time for break, and we will continue this on with Don's question. We have a question from Don, so go ahead and take us into break, Corey. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> when we come back from break, we'll continue our discussion of missing people. Tonight on our panel, we have Eric Markham, our FMP scientist, our Keith Andrews, astrologer and alien specialist, uh, Michael Hall of UFO Eye Team, uh, myself, Corey Reese, and Eric Cooper of Forest Moon Paranormal. Join us every Saturday night at midnight Pacific Standard Time. You can find us on Spreaker.com, SpacedOutRadio.com, and The Fringe FM. And for you local listeners, uh, catch us on KSVU 90.1 on your FM dial. Uh, <clears throat> we will be there from 10 p.m. to midnight. Um on Saturdays. Check out Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott Monday through Friday a Spaced Out Weekend with Joe Roop Saturdays and the Best of Us OR on Sundays, all at 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Also check out the Fringe FM with shows like Lighting the Void with Joe Roop and a plethora of other good shows. Ladies and gentlemen, we will be right back. Hi there, this is Dave Scott from Spaced Out Radio and I want you to come on a nightly journey. Starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, every Monday through Friday, you can come hang out with me and the other space travelers. We have it all from Carl the Alien bouncing on by to those misfit gnomes causing havoc. It's three hours of fun and entertainment on those topics the mainstream really doesn't want to touch. Come get all paranormal with us at spacedoutradio.com and together, my friends, along with our resident guitar god, Bumblefoot, we own the night. Become more intimate and interactive with Spaced Out Radio. Join our Space Travelers Club with your new membership. For $5 a month, we'll provide you with special access to the website, monthly prize draws from books to psychic readings, along with monthly newsletter, private interviews, and more. Sign up today to be part of Spaced Out Radio's experience. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio, or our website including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. This is Eric Markham, news editor for Spaced Out Radio's The Encounter Online. We have put together a great team of writers and journalists from all over the world to bring you top quality paranormal stories from alien encounters to the latest conspiracies. You won't find any of that fake news here. True stories and top notch reporting as we look to bring these experiences to the mainstream. The Encounter online only at spacedoutradio.com. Do you want to know the truth? Do UFOs exist? Are aliens real? Are the governments hiding the biggest secret in history? We're UFO seekers, and we're on a hunt for the truth. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow along with us as we journey across the United States, visiting UFO hotspots and alien hotspots, trying to document the UFO phenomenon. Catch us on Spaced Out Radio every third Monday of the month as we discuss Area 51, UFOs, and more. And also, don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube. Have you had an experience you can't explain? Would you like someone you can trust to look into it? We have just the place. The SOR Sightlines Report is the place for you to find answers. Whether it's Bigfoot, UFOs, Dogman, Ghosts, Aliens, or anything strange, the Sightlines Report will get you connected with one of our expert researchers to find out what's going on. All of your personal information is kept 100% confidential. The SOR Sightlines Report, a place for you to find the answers you need only at spacedoutradio.com. Welcome to Spaced Out Saturdays with me, Dave Cruz from Beyond the Strange. Our weekly feature on spacedoutradio.com will take you around the world discussing everything from the paranormal to the latest conspiracies from the top guests in their fields. We won't leave any story uncovered. Spaced Out Saturdays at spacedoutradio.com starting 9 p.m. Pacific Midnight Eastern. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. 
Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? It's Cosmic Sundays with me, Elizabeth Anglin, in Cosmic Passport. Let me take you down a three-hour spiritual journey where we will get into everything from ET contact to Psychic Sundays. It's a journey of listening and learning together with some of the best professionals in their fields. You can tune in to Cosmic Passport at spacedoutradio.com every Sunday starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern. The views and opinions expressed on tonight's show by tonight's hosts and guests are not necessarily those of Spaced Out Radio, Spaced Out Saturdays, Spaced Out Sundays, or SpacedOutRadio.com. Listener discretion is advised. And now back for hour number two, we have Corey Ruiz, Eric Cooper from Forest Moon Paranormal, and S4. You can find Forest Moon Paranormal on Facebook. And for more information on S4, visit spacedoutradio.com. And now, here's Eric Cooper and Corey Ruiz. All right, welcome back. For those of you just joining us, tonight we are talking about missing people. Where do they go, and is it paranormal? On our panel tonight, we have Eric Markham, R. Keith Andrews, and Michael Hall. Welcome back, everybody. And thanks for having us. Welcome. <laughs> so before the break, we actually had a, a question in the chat room from Don uh, pertaining to future time travel. What if that person died and the atoms moved on? Well, technically they will anyway. But if they died and the atoms moved on, it would have been a, you know, there's a drag time to that. Well, and that's, mm-hmm. that's the premise of the whole theory uh, that I was explaining earlier is that, you know, uh, let's say uh, 2,000 years ago, somebody dies. Well, all of those atomic particles are going to move along now and be collected into the next either person or plant or rock or tree or something that that's going to come about again. Uh, and that's the reason, part of the reason why I was saying is that to go back in time to that point to where those people were alive again and those you know formations and everything else were there, you're going to have to rip everything apart at the atomic level in the current state to reform that place in time in, in in the past to be able to physically go there and see it and touch it and feel it and stuff. You're basically going to make a rip in time uh, and destroy the current time-space continuum to do so. Yeah, and ultimately you're essentially because of the of the pattern of continuity that energy actually follows you'd end up back at this point again and still have the same problem the person would be back to missing <laughs> you know th- this is where it becomes <laughs> you know, kind of an exercise in in painful to, in in painful procrastination which could that explain why search and rescue went through an area and then found the body in the exact same area that they went through a week later? Um, you mean as far as pulling it all apart and putting it back to that? Quite frankly, yeah, that would do it, come to think of it. But, mm-hmm. you know, for that to happen, I mean, you're talking about one massive, because we're not talking about just a reorganization um, of the local area, we're talking across the multiverse being pulled apart. Right. You know, this this is where it gets to be technically you could call it possible, but the odds of it are less than somebody walking along, you know, stepping off a balcony and ending up flying into orbit. 
basically for something like that mm-hmm. to happen, you would notice a serious destruction around you, at least for a moment before you were destroyed, too. Yes. And in the case of being of hypersensitives, they'd feel it. Not fun. Mm-hmm. Okay, we got anything else to bring up as far as the cases go? I think we're about wrapped up on that. So let's talk about what could it be? Do you think any of it's government? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you look at the patterns, and like I was mentioning in the beginning of the show, a lot of these people that are missing, besides the children, uh, a lot of scientists come up missing, a lot of uh, medical personnel come up missing, and that goes by the patterns that Pilates had been looking at. Um, those ones I could probably see the government taking as a high possibility. Yeah. What's your thoughts on that? Scoop them away, take them off to some hidden lab somewhere to do, uh, you know, top secret research, whatever. My labs. I mean, you, you, you talk my labs, they're all military personnel, doctors, scientists, that kind of thing. Yeah, how about if we don't go into the heavy duty on the no. my lab side? No, but, we're, uh, no, 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 we're not. We're not, <laughs> we're not going to. Uh, I'm only bringing that up because uh, other than secret labs, that kind of thing, uh, that, that's the only thing I could think of where they take a doctor or a scientist. Oh no, I was referring to. I'm not going into my fun with that. Uh, not fun. No, but no, not even is... a little bit. <laughs> That is absolutely correct. Um, That's how they get a lot of their scientists in, is they pull Mm -hmm. them out of of an area. And again, it it depends on the, sadly, the credentials of the individual going missing. Potentially high-profile or um, cutting-edge thinkers are pulled out in order to get the information dealt with. Because, uh, you know, there, there's one specific case, and Michael, you might remember more details about this. I, I, I remember this case vaguely, but it was, uh, I believe she was a scientist or a doctor. She was able to make a phone call when she found herself lost, didn't know how she got there. They sent a helicopter in. It crashed. Um, then there was a storm. When they finally went back to the location, she was gone, and I believe the helicopter pilot was gone as well. Does that one ring a bell? Wow, I, I, uh, that's that's a new one on me. But uh, I have, I have heard of those uh, reports where, you know, the the weather just turns ugly immediately after someone miss it, it turns up missing. And uh, right. helpers, you know, search and rescue for, for days or sometimes weeks uh, right afterwards. Uh, it seems to be a part of the pattern that uh, David Polites mm-hmm. has uh, pulled together. Yeah. You know, there yeah. is another uh, aspect, there, there's another aspect uh, that uh, is kind of fascinating as well with these clusters and these um, things happening within the national and state parks. We, we have a member uh, of our UFO I team, uh, uh, Lee Strauss, who is a, an FAA uh, drone pilot. You have to have a license nowadays, by the way, to, uh, mm-hmm. to uh, pilot, pilot a drone in, uh, you know, over public land or anything like that. But they are prohibited to going uh, in, into uh, national and state parks. You cannot fly a drone in those areas. So I've always wondered uh, why that is such a big admonition. You would think that uh, it'd be, uh, if, if you were hunting for a Bigfoot or any kind of a cryptid uh, or even just trying to uh, take a, a survey of certain uh, uh, animal species, that that would be a real easy thing to do, use a drone uh, with some, uh, uh, you know, flare technology or, you know, um, <clears throat> night vision or those kinds of things. So 
I, I thought that was fascinating because uh, you cannot <laughs> you cannot use a drone in state or national parks. That's not a shock I, from my standpoint. <clears throat> yeah, I, I I find that disturbing. Um, <laughs> Uh, you, you know, I'll have to talk to Steve because uh, FMP has a, a drone guy as well, which we haven't haven't had to use him on cases yet because we haven't actually gone exploring the mountains yet. That's something we plan on doing this year. Um, yeah. But that, yeah, and, and why would that be? I, I, I understand the concept of no drones around airports because you're going to interfere with, you know, you know, airplanes, helicopters, that thing. But what's the big deal about a drone over national forests? There's well, that yeah. that makes no sense. Actually, it makes total sense if you want to go outside the realm of normalcy. You see, well, and, and, and <laughs> go ahead. Well, the point being, if you've got a if you've got an access point there, or if you've got a underground complex that. Offworlders are using in conjunction with with government national parks would be mm-hmm. the perfect way to cover it. Yes, and, and, and Keith, I think you hit the nail on the head there because you know obviously hey, exactly if this if this uh, 1947 or were 45 uh, treaty that was made with Eisenhower and the offworlders to actually be able to abduct certain people and a certain amount of people, who knows? Who knows where they are uh, getting their quota nowadays? You know. Well, that's just yeah. Uh, that's the only reason they would keep drones out. Something Thank they you. were hiding. I mean, let's face it. So, Area Fifty One used to be great. They'd say, you know, there's nothing out here, but we'll shoot you if you look. Uh, yeah. Well, that, and that's why they brought up the Groom Lake Range. Because people used to be able to go up on, a, I believe it was Groom Lake Range, and look down on Area 51. And the yeah. Air Force said, oh, no, no, we can't have that happen. So they bought, the government bought Groom Lake Range, the mountain range, and now people can't go up there. They get accosted, well, they get chased it. out. <laughs> right, right. They, still, so, they took all that yeah. farm and eminent domain and all that crap. And, and yeah. you know, there, there, I have no proof of it, but you know, supposedly Area 51's got service to air missiles. They've got uh, vib- vibration detectors. So they can tell if you're walking, uh, that kind of thing. So if you were were to take a drone over it, it'd probably be shot down. Um, yeah, and then they just find like you know, running the drone. Yeah. Oh, a drone going across Area 51. <laughs> yeah, you can't. Yeah, that. Yeah, and they would bury you under the prison. That would be one of like those. Carry, it it, it yeah. would be the same thing as it. Uh, you know, it'd be the same thing as a civilian taking pictures outside a military base. They would accost you. They would probably uh, snatch you up, confine you, interview you. Uh, well, mm-hmm. interrogate, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, and it'd be the same thing with a drone, because drones have cameras. Um, but I'd be curious, who would come after you if you did take a drone over the National Forest? FBI? What were they doing out there? I mean, think about it. I, I'd be willing to take that chance. Who comes after me for having a drone over a National Forest, which is public land, technically? Yeah. Well, you know, David uh, Polites has mentioned that the Forest Service has its own enforcement arm uh, of uh, basic, basically special agents as well. So uh, they are Secret. probably the ones that would, would come and get you. Secret government, anyone? Well, yeah, well, yeah, they're the ones no, you see wearing the that. sidearms. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, they go uh, above and, and I, beyond I, park rangers tripping. I've run into them out at... Uh, Tripping in the the speaker chat song about park rangers. I ran into some. I used to live in Tennessee, and there was this fantastic place called Cross Creeks Federal Wildlife Refuge. It was on both sides of the Cumberland River. It was right on the Mississippi Migratory Flyway, so 
you would see stuff here that you just wouldn't see anywhere else. And the guys that patrolled there <laughs> wore a different, a different Park Service uniform. They were armed, uh, like, you know, like state cops. So yeah, they were, and yeah. that was a, that was a federal wildlife refuge. Friendly but enough here's the if thing. you weren't doing, if you were just out there with your cameras, but. <laughs> The North Cascades is hundreds and hundreds of miles long. So the chance of them a, a, being able to get to you, depending on where you're at, I mean, think about it. How many of well, these secret park rangers do you think they have? Well, Eric, I, I, have, I have a good story <laughs> uh, to, to uh, relate to you. I, I have an actual piece of property up there. Uh, north of OMAC in the center of the state of Washington mm -hmm. that is actually mm -hmm. uh, my, north, my nor northern fence line is the Canadian border, literally. And uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the folks that live up there know about these border patrol drones. I don't know if you've ever, if you've ever heard of that, but they actually will track by satellite anyone who goes near the border, whether there's a border crossing or just a uh, three strand, uh, you know, barbed wire fence. Uh, they will know anybody that's close enough to the border, uh, to, to trip the, uh, or to find on, uh, on the actual satellites. And, and th what they do, I guess, is they send out a drone. If you are too close to the border, uh, when the, uh, satellite comes over, you know, every 90 minutes or whatever. Uh, my, my friends that have property up there says that they've actually seen the drones come out and, uh, you know, whenever someone was too close to the border. So I would imagine that even on the North Cascades up there by Glacier, by Mount Baker and all those things, mm -hmm. uh, they, they've got satellites trained on that whole entire area. I bet they could pick out a drone very easily. Hmm. But the thing is, you're, you're, you're talking a whole different realm because you're talking about terrorism and they're, and I, I'm just, I'm only playing devil's advocate because, well, Homeland Security side of it. Um, but when you're talking about that close to a border, you're talking a whole other, uh, a whole different job, a whole different aspect. Um, when it comes to ICE and, and uh, Customs Border Patrol. Um, but I'm curious, if you're in the middle of the Cascades, say over towards Granite Falls, that kind of area, it would be the same satellite, I'm sure. It'd be the same, possibly the same drone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it could be. Uh, and those drones, by the way, have uh, have some kind of laser uh, laser capability. They can they can shoot shoot from those drones. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah, the people that the oh, yeah, lasers know. haven't developed to that point are, shall we say, a little behind schedule. <laughs> I'm going to have to make me a phone call or two. Uh, yeah, and talk to some people about that one. Because <laughs> uh, now, now, now you got my curiosity peaked. <laughs> well, the problem with a lot of the stuff that is top secret is that oh, you but, can make the phone uh, call uh, and they won't tell you. Top secret. <laughs> yeah. Well, that too. But I, but I, I've got I've got a professor that's in Homeland Security that uh, works with drones, and uh, gave me his number. So uh, any questions I got, I, yeah, we'll have a chat. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Um. So okay, we talked government. There's no doubt government's behind a lot of it. Uh, you know, we have military bases in the mountains that nobody's supposed to know about. Yeah, um, they're not there. No, no, no. They're they're never there. Uh, you know, <laughs> we 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 have we have an expedition. We're going to be planning uh, uh, north of us. I'll say that much. Um, where there are federal, uh, there's areas of the federal, the, the national forest that you actually do get accosted. And one theory with that is there is radiation in the soil, and there's supposedly mining the radiation in the soil. Anyone heard about that one? Ah. Well, my Only from you. Been... 
Go ahead. <laughs> Say it again. I mean, I've only you've discussed it with me, is what I'm saying. I haven't heard it except you relayed it to me, and I thought, uh huh, <laughs> that's going to be a. I will definitely be bringing the 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 tools along to investigate that. Yeah. Well. Uh, well, may, may, maybe we'll make a trip when you come up here in May. I'm hoping. See, off-worlders bring your, have been bring, mining, your bring your tools. <laughs> you know, the, the off-worlders have been mining radiation for centuries. And it, it really boils down to the same idea as mining U-235 or whatever. It's just they happen to use a slightly different, if you will, gathering tool. Mm-hmm. And let's face it, it's a whole lot easier to, to, um, to mine a particle that is just floating there than it is to dig the thing up. <laughs> Well, if it's ionizing radiation, you just capture, it's a lot easier to catch it on something like a diffraction grid or you don't have to mine ore and go through all the the messy parts. You just use the passage of the ionizing radiation through the grid to create a current and you charge something. Yeah. No, it, it's basically now, the same principle as the fuel scoops they use. Right. And yes, mankind will get to there. This is one of the reasons why I get a kick out of the whole nuclear program. Uh, yeah. Now let's talk UFOs because here, here's one thing I'd like to do, and I, I know you've already kind of hit on it, Michael, uh, with UFO uh, sighting patterns uh, in conjunction with these cluster maps. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, there's... Uh, you know, if, if I was uh, an off-world race that had made some kind of a treaty or, or an agreement with the federal government, uh, no matter if it's this country or another, another country, uh, it would seem logical that you would use federal property, whether it was uh, uh, indigenous American in a reservations, uh, state or, or federal lands, uh, to be able to come and go from. I mean that would they're they're, protect, they're protected. You can't have drones on them. The uh, forest services uh, and their um, enforcement agencies seem to not want to keep records of uh, people that come up missing in those areas. So it kind of makes sense that something like that would happen uh, in a state park or federal park. Because mm -hmm. you've got the infrastructure and the controls in place already. Michael, with the, yeah. the research you did, did you notice anything about, the, the, is there a preponderance of disappearances along the 37th parallel? Because it seems like there's, there's somebody who's research, you yeah. know, that their research tends to say that that's a band of the highest activity. You know, I've heard that same thing. Uh, I don't know that David Polites' uh, cluster maps uh, prove that out, but I have definitely heard. Uh, matter of fact, the sighting reports, if you talk to Peter Davenport of the National UFO Reporting Center, um, that would be a good database to, um, to bring that question to because uh, he has all the sighting reports um, of anomalous aerial activity throughout the country. Every FAA tower in the United States, whether it's uh, commercial uh, or military, uh, in, in their tower manual, they have the National UFO Reporting Center hotline. So they usually get most of the reports that are made. And it would be interesting to see if they cluster or at least, uh, you know, kind of uh, hover around that kind of 37th parallel. Yeah, I'd like to be mm -hmm. see if uh, his if his cluster maps in any way correlate with Chuck Ch uh, Zukowski's. I think it was thirty eighth, not thirty seventh. It's ah, one yeah. or the other. But anyhow, Chuck Zukowski did you know spend a lot of time tracking sightings along the parallel, and it was just nice to be cool to see if there was any kind of correlation. That and between 
Yeah. UFO, so, you know, a UFO flap in the midst. There's so many different what things it would be fun to correlate these cluster maps to, but just getting the raw data is, you know, Go project in its own right. Yeah. <laughs> getting true data that's not been tainted or, you know, screwed with is good luck. Well, you could even, with yeah. your guys, with your guys, um, number of sightings and, and events, um, I, I presume you guys have your records on computer. Run a data analysis and see what your own over what your own site um, cases correlate on. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, that would be a good that would be a good idea. And uh, Dr. Richard Haynes as well, uh, who heads the, the NARCAP, uh, um, which is the yeah NICAP. The the well, it's it's NICAP was the old agency, but this is NARCAP that they have all the pilot records. Uh, okay, um, you know okay. he has an air, what he calls his AirCat database of over three thousand uh, pilot reports, military and civilian and commercial, and that would be an interesting uh, database to uh, go through as well for that that same same idea. <laughs> mm-hmm. We need to get, uh, if you could talk to him, I'll send an email if we could get Peter Davenport on the show uh, one of these times uh, to oh. to bring this up again. That would be oh. interesting. He just, he's an old man and it's hard to get him to, and a busy old man. It's kind of hard hey, to get him he, to stay he, up he, this late. <laughs> It, it, it is. I, I've talked to him on email, and uh, he's, he, I know I know you can vouch for this, Michael, but he's usually in bed by now. Yeah. Now, Keith, I want to jump onto the alien side with you. Uh, what races do you know that stay in the mountains all the time? Uh, getting away from the wormhole side, but we know there are certain races that actually reside in the mountains. As you go oh, into yeah. that a little bit. Well, one of the biggest races that stays in the mountains isn't even off-worlder. You would know them as dwarves. Many of the okay. of the Fae, which are are actually Terran based, they actually they actually evolved here. Are are another group? Okay. Um, you even look at many of the elementals, like especially the Earth elementals. They literally right, live right. up there. Okay, but. Getting on that, would they have a reason to take humans? Um, they would, um, but not from a like. They certainly wouldn't be the ones taking the kids, unless what I have seen with some of them is if a child is being abused in their natural home, mm-hmm. and they mm-hmm. get an opportunity, they will, without a shadow of a doubt, yank the abused child out for their own protection, but they've got no way of getting them back, so they simply adopt them and raise them. I have found, I think I met a dwarf, and they are not yeah. like the lawn ornament. Uh, <laughs> no. No, they no, are. No, 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 no. They are a Those very are dense, very, no, they're not like the seven dwarves type shit. They are a, <laughs> they are a, massive species you can see them as earth movers and it's just i this person one who just made my weirdo meter peg and it wasn't so much what the person said or did it was and they were very personable i mean it wasn't like this was a weird person there was just something and the voice sounded like it was coming out of his feet. It was so deep. So, oh yeah, yeah the revelation oh. is is something bizarre. Yes, it was. I came away thinking that was not a that was not a human. Well, uh, yeah. well the, the, you lucked out, Mark. The, the, <laughs> the, the, they got that off Disney. That, uh, that's uh, the Disney concept. Yeah, bad well, news for you. <laughs> no, they didn't. Huh? No, Markham, try that vice versa. <laughs> Markham, you can't, no, you can't leave us hanging there. you you got to tell us the details of how the heck you <laughs> this is work. It, I just, I was, well, when I was doing my uh, 
I used to be a travel tech, and I would go all over this country. And when I wasn't at work, I had my hydration pack, uh, emergency supplies, and I just went out. Like really? I said, I used to get in trouble. <laughs> <I'm> not, <laughs> just like, <laughs> no cell phone signal, only three flares for the gun. I, you know, I got to get myself out of this. And just wow. out of the middle of nowhere, hiking in a remote area, I ran into, come around a, 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 a pass, and there's this person, probably three or four inches shorter than I am, but stocky. It's just yeah. massively stocky. Not mm. and and uh, you know it wasn't even so much a, a an appearance as it was an impression. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I just thought that this, this person probably weighed half a ton. <laughs> the impression was this person was very dense. Very, I don't know, it was an interesting, it was really, it was an interesting encounter, just basically, oh, I'm just out goofing around, you know, I'm out spending time, I love to, you know, I love to be outside, I don't like being cooped up inside all the time, and this is, you know, this is the me, my, me time, so to speak. And just wow. a general, and then I went my way, and that individual, I assume, either crawled back into their cave or <laughs> went back, whatever happened, you know, it was like, you know, it was like, just basically talked, non, you know, nothing in particular, and then I went my way, and they went theirs. And, you know, that encounter, it wasn't until later I thought, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, I just it was an impression I came away with and I just there was something about it the the longer I walked the more I thought I just encountered something that wasn't run of the mill human inter interface change. Like I said the yeah, person they voice was middle. almost like if if a bass amp could speak <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a good way to put it. <laughs> you know, yeah. The closest I can come to is when I saw Kansas in concert a few years ago. I was standing right in front of the base tower for the base, and that the water in my my uh, uh, water bottle was vibrating to the. It was that same kind of almost like a subsonic resonance. Yeah. And, you know, the funny thing is that is one of their techniques, and especially with one that size. Now, correct me if I'm wrong there, there, Eric, but you're you're close to the six-foot mark, aren't you? Mm-hmm, just under. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you know, this is the funny thing with, with the ancient dwarves. For one to be that high, like that tall, you're not talking a young dwarf. Okay, no. you're talking one from way, that has been around since way before man was was built. I had the I had the feeling that I was in the presence of profound wisdom. I will say that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, I kind of had the definitely. feeling that this <laughs> this individual was dumbing themselves down to be you know to be conversational with me <laughs> but it was a very genial uh inter- interchange there was nothing confrontational about it and well, it, well, was think just, someone is, it was just this random meeting out in the desert with <laughs> you know somebody that just didn't you know and this this area has petroglyphs that go back to probably anasazi times and it's just it's an amazing area in its own right so you know something was bound to happen out there just and, being and think someone out has there got, to put you in that I think someone has got ancient knowledge 
Well, well yeah, I exactly. Might have been, there's a lot of mines out there too. A lot, of, and you know, that's one of the. There's a lot of, you know, people that have a little claim out there. Or they've got an illegal mine, a mineral mine, gold or whatever, mm-hmm. and you have to be, you know, cautious. Stay in the main pathway. You know, not get too nosy, or you know, you might get shot and never seen again. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, Keith, Keith answered the question in the chat room, but I'm going to ask it, ask it here on the air too. But uh, Don was asking, who's the tall alien race or off-world race that's in a consortium that is a medical doctor or medical person? Yeah, and that's that's the Pleiadians, and mm-hmm. that's one one of the few races that you'll never see a purebred on Earth. You know, right. Yeah, they can't. They can't live here, can they? No, they'd be dead within minutes. And we wouldn't last on their planet either, right? Yeah, about or, the same length of time. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. what? Where do the mantids fit in, Keith? They're they're supposed to be like a scientific medical race. Are they just purely? I, I hear both ways on them. I mean, some people say they just feel like they were in the presence of the mantids and it was just this uh, completely positive and others were scared to death. Well, again, it really boils down to people's perspective where it comes to doctors in the first place. <laughs> but the the problem, the thing with the mantids, yes, they're a medical race. The complication is they're more interested in the, sorry, in the research of what makes people tick. And when I say people in this case, I mean every race. Um, so yeah, they, 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 they experiment on other off-worlders, do they not? Oh, quite readily. And, <laughs> you know, they're, they're are they really, like, oh, if we take this arm off, it quit, you know, are they the... Do the, the kind of dispassionate? Oh, we oops, we broke them, or are they? they yeah. <laughs> no, they they aren't dispassionate about oh we broke them so much as well that didn't work out that well. Um, the ones that are the ones <laughs> that are really, other back. yeah it's like oops. <laughs> the ones that are really Good. dispassionate about it are the vegans because the vegans don't have a pain center, so they've got no concept. Of, you know, if you lost an arm, what are you complaining about? I mean, you know, we'll just hook another one up and carry on. You know, (laughs) know, anesthetic for the vegans is a non-existent item. At least the mantids have the anesthetic. They may not use it on you, but at least they've got it. (laughs) Okay, getting back to which races live in the mountains, and uh, yeah, I know, I, I know, we've got the elements, we've got the fey roamers up there, and uh, you know, I, I say that, and I think of the changelings when it comes to the kids, because the changelings, you, you've heard of the the fairy lore where you know you, you've <laughs> they, they'll take a baby out of the fairy ring and they'll replace it with a changeling, which is, which is a very grotesque, ugly looking baby that came from the fairy realm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But they aren't replacing these kids with changelings. Uh, the kids are just missing and, well, appearing somewhere else. Uh, well, you know, the, the unfortunate part is you do have um, some, some groups of the, of the tech will be up there. The tech luck will be up there. And, mm-hmm. I mean, let's face it, if they're snagging somebody, you're not going to find a trace of them. Right? No, they're gone. <laughs> you know, you're you're just completely hooped on that one. Um, They're a snack. <laughs> well, they are. You know, and for the little for the little tech, they're actually a meal. But you know, that's another issue altogether. You know, right. they're the when you're starting to look at the grays are up there, but as we know, the grays do come and go. And, and I, I think the Greys would be one that would come through a wormhole, snatch you up, take you back. Essentially, yeah. And they're the ones, Greys are ones that will pick you up, 
but they'll return you alive. You know, right. Because from their standpoint, if you, if you pass away, there's no point in putting you back. No. And and that would be a typical alien abduction scenario. Exactly. Yeah. And as we all know, you know, you get abducted. But the other thing is there, when you take a look, the water are also known to stay in the mountains, especially in the forested regions, because the water won't come down into civilized into the civilized area very often. Mm-hmm. OK, and there the funny thing there is water, when you look at them from a distance are very similar in stance in in their movements as bigfoot they're just not they're just tend to be a little tend to be a lot shorter and a lot broader right and but the tech flex are... i'm not uh, yeah the tech flex i'm not surprised by uh because we we know they're here in the North Cascades, uh, for example. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Bigfoot, yeah, we've kind of ruled out Bigfoot. I don't think Bigfoot's taking anybody. Um, Bigfoot would, like but said, water would. Would not. I, I don't think Bigfoot is involved, other than, like you said earlier in the show, taking the kids and, and trying to find them their home or helping them in whatever the way they can. And going by the descriptions of some of the kids that were found alive, you know, one of them said they they saw the, the big hairy monster. Yeah. And that would fit. So, the water, that's the, the thing. The water would take somebody and remove them. But again, you're dealing with people, when we're talking about people that go missing completely, this does not account for the ones that show up dead. Right, and that, that's Most something off the list. Show up dead might be, you know, misadventure, maybe exposure to elements. Uh, More often than not, yeah. Now, and, who's that and race that's something off. Think? Go ahead. That, that, what, that, that, that's something off to look into as far as the statistics go. Is how many disappeared versus how many were found dead versus how many found were found alive. I like to see those statistics. Well, did we yeah, ever nail it down? Did we ever nail it down who the race was that was trying to get into? They were trying to get into the base on Shasta when Liz and I were driving through that area, and the people that are running Shasta were like, "No, you can't come in because you'll say anything." That basically, it's a race of reptilians. They'll say anything. They want to. They think you want to hear to get their way, and then once they're in there, they do as they please. They don't follow the rules. Oh, I know. I, now, I know of one race that would do that. Do you have a description or at least a height of, like, a size of who these people were? No, I didn't even see the ship. It was just a matter of, and I know we were followed later that night because we saw a reddish ship out in the desert, you know, as we were heading out of, uh, you know, we were outside of Rachel, Nevada. We were at a crossroads outside of Rachel, out in the middle of no damn where. Uh, but did this race, I, they're, they're one of the reptilian races. They yep. couldn't, they would not, you know, they were using the cloud. They were keeping this cloud around the craft. Okay. You know, all the I'm other exactly clouds in the area were moving, but that cloud was not moving. Yeah. And it was hugging right on the top of Mount Shasta. And there is only one race that'll do that, that will try and get into a place and totally disregard rules. And those are the Tormenon. They're okay. a they're an offshoot they're actually related to both Strazazian and the Drakes. But the Tormenon are a mercenary crew, and they will do what they please. They will say what they have to, and they will agree to everything you ask them to mm-hmm. in order to get through the door, and then pretty much you're hooped. Yep. It's like letting the Klingons in. <laughs> yeah, you're just asking for a problem if you let these guys through the door because 
it's not that you can't trust them. You can trust them to lie to you. It's pretty easy. You trust them to be okay. Now they're not <laughs> the ones that messed with that apparently abducted me last weekend, right? No, no. You see the the biggest difference between the Tormanon and the Suzazians is Tormanon have a fully prehensile tail. The Srizazians, the big ones, just don't. And, of course, the drakes, you know, because of their height. The ones that grabbed you, do you remember what what height they were? I don't remember anything of the situation other than they took me, did something with my nose, actually broke my nose to do whatever they did, (laughs) but I wasn't conscious for it. They were able to do it in broad daylight. They put... And like I said, folks, this wasn't something I did during the day and forgot about. What happened to the bridge of my nose was something that, like, imagine getting hit across the bridge of the nose with a dinner plate edge on. I mean, Um, this is, yeah, I would have woken up had it happened, or or I would have remembered it happening. I woke up, and and it's healed now. A week later, I can't feel the dent. The chunk that apparently was missing on my nasal bone is healed. Yeah. I don't know who. Oh, I can I tell you who. A... I, I, I've got a pretty good bet on who, and it's not so much <laughs> breaking your nose because of what they did, so much as what they weren't quite capable of doing. You're hmm. dealing with Srizazian technology, and the problem is they can break your nose by touching it. Ah, uh. <laughs> you know, I watched them. I've I literally watched them dislocate somebody's shoulder, and they literally pulled their hand back. and A quizzical look from a Srizazian is kind of disturbing, but he pulled his hand back, and he looks at me and he goes, "Oh, fragile, aren't they?" <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, they're the ones that have to go through a lot of training to even be able to. Okay. No, it was just across the bridge of my nose. Like I said, it's like somebody cracked me on the side of the nose with a dinner plate, edge yeah. on. There was a and, you know, <laughs> just a yeah. That was that undoubtedly was. They, I'm not debating whether they put something in. <laughs> the problem is the break was the accident part. Oh, now hold his head. This will cr- oops. <laughs> I can see <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. It's funny. Okay, so. it's, it's kind of like the training they go through is kind of like if you were to to soak an egg in vinegar to get the shell to to come off it, and now you have to, as an individual, pick that egg up without breaking the skin. Uh. Yeah, you know, that's All the right. kind of training coming... they have to go through, but. Uh. Uh, God, we're we're almost... coming down to yeah, we're coming down to eight minutes left of the show. Uh, Keith, go ahead and tell uh, our listeners where they can find your YouTube channel and uh, your website. Well, the website's a bit of a challenge, but the YouTube channel is R Keith Andrews, and you know I try and keep up on it. Doesn't work that well. Eventually, <laughs> once I <laughs> once I get it sorted it around it'll be inner voice enterprises dot ca i just haven't got it set yet that's the website and i just haven't got it set yet that's and of course, course and my, on the youtube it'll tell you the rest right and michael where can people find the ufoi team well you can always find us at uh ufoiteam.com on the internet for our website and you can always check out our Facebook page as well where we live stream our weekly meetings uh, at ufoiteam um, yeah you can always find us very easily there matter of fact I don't know if you guys are interested but uh, we have got a new haunting paranormal hit on our hands at the UFOI team called the Ballad of Mel's Hole if you have time we can go out with some music Sounds great. Sounds great. And uh, I know we have some folks in the uh, chat room that are having, it looks like, paranormal issues. Uh, you can find Forest Moon Paranormal 
as usual, just go on Facebook, join the group. Don't go to the page because I don't check the page very often. Unless, of course, I get a message that, hey, go check out the messages on the page. And then I go look. <laughs> but, um, yeah, go to Florida Moon Paranormal Facebook and join the group. That's where all of our files are. You'll find a plethora of information. And you can also find us at www.forcewoundparanormal.spruz.com, S-P-R-U-Z.com. And on that note, would love to listen to your file, Michael. All right. Well, let's see if we can do it right now here. Let me start the... Oh, I see. See if we can. <laughs> That's okay. I'm technologically challenged myself. More so than most. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I, doggone it. It's not working here because I'm on the phone at the same time trying to do it. So I'll have to do this another time here. But I, I just want to thank, uh, you know, Eric and, and Keith and, and Corey and yourself there, Eric, for allowing me to be on the show tonight. I've, I've learned a whole lot tonight. Oh, we enjoyed having you. Oh, well, at least I did. Oh, yeah, it's always a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, you're an awesome asset to the show. Um, and, and like I said, we're going to try to get Mr. Anderson on the show. Uh, he's our Bigfoot guy. He wants to come on and do a, a Bigfoot episode. And we rarely get to talk about Bigfoot on the show. Just because there's so much stuff to talk about. I mean, every week. Uh, next week, we have a round table. Um, everyone's going to be on the round table as usual. Bring your three questions to the show. And we'll have a blast. We always do. We might even go a third hour. We'll see. We have done a, we have done over time in a while, so you know, round table is always the perfect show for overtime. Yeah, because we never get through the questions. We don't. But you know what? <laughs> I, I I I don't care because we get information out there. Even if we only get to one question with everybody, the information gets out there. And actually, round tables in a couple of weeks. We have uh, Earth's mysteries next week. Oh, okay. I don't have a calendar in front of me. I thought the next week was the third week. No, there you no, go. Earth yet. Mysteries. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and tomorrow, for all the locals, uh, well, of course, if you're local, you're going to be listening to this. If you don't, didn't hear it tonight, it'll be in a couple of weeks because it'll be on KSVU. But if you're listening live, go to Annie's Pizza here in Concrete, 2 p.m., and Michael's going to be telling us all about the legal aspects of the paranormal. And if I twist his arm enough, you might even talk about some government stuff. That would be great. There you go. <laughs> All right. Thank you, for everyone, for listening. It's been a great show, as usual. Corey, go ahead and take us home. All right. I can do that here. Give me just a moment. I would like to thank uh, our panel tonight, uh, Mr. Eric Markham, our f and scientist, our Keith Andrews, uh, astrologist and alien specialist, uh, Michael Hall of UFO I-Team. You guys were awesome tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Join us next Saturday at midnight Pacific Standard Time as we discuss Earth's mysteries. You can find us on Spreaker.com, SpacedOutRadio.com, and the Fringe FM. Uh, also, for all you local listeners, you can find us on KSVU 90.1 on your FM dial. Uh, I would like to thank all of our listeners, because without you, there is no S4. Good night, and remember, keep your eyes to the skies.